With those things said, let's turn now in our Bibles to uh, the book of 1 Corinthians. We are in a series through this uh, incredible book, 1 Corinthians. This morning we come to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. So please pull out your Bibles, turn there, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Uh, if you need a Bible this morning, as always, there's a number of Bibles in the seat backs in front of you. And uh, so use one of those Bibles if you don't have one. Um, keep one of those Bibles if you don't have one. We'd love to give it to you as a gift. Uh, but uh, in those Bibles, this morning's passage is found on page 959, page 959. So as you're turning there, 1 Corinthians 12, uh, let me just remind you that in the book of 1 Corinthians, we're in a larger section of this book, a larger section that runs from uh, chapter 11 all the way through to chapter 14. And this larger section of 1 Corinthians deals with the topic of corporate worship, right? What does it mean for God's people as we come together for corporate worship? Paul deals with this in a number of ways. This morning, we begin a new topic within that larger topic. That topic is spiritual gifts, the topic of spiritual gifts. Apparently, spiritual gifts were a matter that the Apostle Paul and the Corinthians had written, corresponded back and forth about. And in this morning's passage, the Apostle Paul picks that dialogue log up and takes the conversation further, as it were. Okay, so 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 1, um, follow along as I read. Uh, keep in mind, these are Paul's words to the Corinthians. These are God's words to us this morning. So let's read. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now there are various gifts, but the same Spirit. There are various services, but the same Lord. There are various activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. To another, the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healings by the one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit, who apportions to each one individually as he wills. So often when we see a young, talented athlete or musician or student with unique and remarkable skills, right? We say about that young person, wow, they have a gift. They are really gifted. Now, when we say that, we're not saying that gifted young people should, shouldn't hone their gift, right? No, they should keep shooting those hoops, right? They should keep on practicing those musical scales. They should keep working out those math equations to be sure. But what we are saying is that this young person has been given an ability that they should steward, right? They are gifted. Now, here's the thing. Did you know that if you are a Christian this morning, whether you have known the Lord Jesus for 80 seconds or 80 years, if you are a Christian this morning, you are profoundly gifted. You've been gifted. God has gifted each of his children with special gifts, spiritual gifts, 
for the building up of the church. No Christian is excluded. Every Christian is needed. All of us, each and every one is gifted. The question is, what are you doing with your gifts? Now, the Corinthians, they knew all of this, but apparently uh, they were a bit confused about the nature of spiritual gifts and, and the use of the spiritual gifts and uh, kind of reading between the lines uh, of the next several chapters, it seems pretty clear that some members of the Corinthian church were flaunting certain spiritual gifts and they were wearing certain spiritual gifts like badges of honor or sources of pride. And, and some of them ironically were even using spiritual gifts in very unloving ways. All right, now, now thankfully for us, as you know, the Corinthians dysfunction actually leads to our instruction here in this text because the Apostle Paul, in responding to these matters, gives us several chapters of very helpful teaching on spiritual gifts. So as we dive into it, we need to realize that any discussion of spiritual gifts must center around the, the person and work of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is the one who apportions these gifts. And so the passage uh, before us lays out into three sections. All of these sections are related to the Holy Spirit. Uh, so we see the Spirit's focus in verses one through three. We see the Spirit's gifts in verses four through 10. And we see the Spirit's distribution of those gifts in verse 11, those three points. So let's uh, take a look as we work our way through this text. First of all, notice the Spirit's focus there in verses one through three. I'll pick it up in 12 verse one. We read now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. In these verses, of course, Paul introduces the topic, right? Spiritual gifts we see here. And then Paul reminds the Corinthians that it would come, when it comes to spiritual things, when it comes to the spiritual realm, Look, they came from pagan backgrounds where they often engaged in spiritual rituals and spiritual experiences of various kinds. But all of those spiritual experiences for them back in their pagan past had only led them to mute, powerless idols. So it begs a question. How can someone tell the difference? How can someone tell the difference on the one hand between godless, demonic, spiritual experiences and on the other hand, authentic spiritual experiences that are empowered by the Holy Spirit of the one true God? How can you tell the difference between the two? Between the false and what is true? Paul says the difference is the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the Holy Spirit magnifies Christ. So verse three, therefore I want you to understand that no one speaking in the spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. So we see here that Paul draws this massive contrast between false religions and the one true religion, as it were. He says, unbelievers in pagan, secular, demonic religions reject Jesus as Lord. They effectively curse Jesus. And so they prove that the Holy Spirit is not at work among them. Some other spirit is at work. On the other hand, Paul says, no one is actually able to truly say from the heart, Jesus is Lord, unless the Holy Spirit has enabled them to do so, okay? So, so in other words, all true Christians have been given the Holy Spirit who enables them to hail Jesus as Lord, to submit to Jesus as Lord, to believe upon Jesus as Lord. Now, these verses, I think, teach us some important things. First of all, we see here that every Christian, by definition, has the Holy Spirit. 
Do you see that here? So like there's no special levels within Christianity where like some people have the spirit and some people don't. No, by definition, every Christian has the spirit living in them. In fact, this text tells us that you can't even recognize and proclaim Jesus as Lord in a saving way unless the Holy Spirit enables you to do that. So are you a Christian this morning? If so, all of the Spirit is all yours. Think about that. (laughs) All of the person of the Holy Spirit is all yours. Maybe you're here and you're not a Christian believer this morning. If so, um, I want you to see here that the Bible calls you to submit to the Jesus Christ as Lord, right? The Bible calls you to believe upon Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, to, to hail Jesus as Lord of your life and Lord of everything. That's a big decision to make, isn't it? And according to this text, you will only actually hail Jesus as Lord and make that saving decision if in fact the Holy Spirit of God gives you the ability to make that decision. So what that means for you, if you're not a Christian, is that one thing you can pray as you're seeking out this Christian gospel and trying to think this stuff through is you can pray to God and ask God to give you the enlightening power of his Holy Spirit so that you can understand Jesus and claim him for yourself. And that's the kind of prayer that God loves to answer. Notice also here that the Holy Spirit's focus in these verses, his focus is Jesus, right? The Holy Spirit's focus is Jesus Christ. See, one of the special things that the Holy Spirit does is that he platforms Jesus. The Holy Spirit spotlights Jesus. He magnifies Jesus Christ as Lord. In other words, we could put it this way. Did you know the Holy Spirit has a specialty? (laughs) The Holy Spirit specializes in helping God's people to see and savor the Lord Jesus Christ. That's just what he does. So here's why this matters. When it comes to any discussions that we're having about spiritual gifts in the church, one way that we can know if our church is putting the right and healthy emphasis on the spirit and the gifts is if Jesus is being exalted in the process. Our exploration of these spiritual gifts should result in the exaltation of Jesus. And any church that emphasizes the works of the Spirit at the expense of Jesus, that church has gotten off balance. They've lost their way. On the other hand, the healthiest churches, in the healthiest churches, the ministries of the Spirit always point to Christ. They always exalt Jesus Christ. Why? Because the Spirit's focus is Jesus. He's the Spirit's Focus. That's number one. Notice next, the Spirit's gifts. Verses four through 11, the Spirit's gifts. We pick it up in verse four. Paul says, now there are very varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers all in everyone. Now, in these verses, we encounter a sort of key word. It's the word gifts, and there in verse four, the word gifts. If you'd like to underline square or circle, that's a key word to underline uh, for the next several chapters of this book, the word gifts. Now, sometimes it can be helpful and interesting to know the Greek word behind the English translation. In this case, the word gift in Greek is the word, excuse me, the word gift in English is the Greek word charisma. Charisma, does that sound familiar? Uh, From this word charisma, we get words like charismatic and so forth. Uh, Gift is charisma. Now, a couple weeks ago, I was talking about the word charisma and my kids let me have it because they're like, dad, when you said charisma, all we could hear was riz. I'm like, okay, that's weird. What's riz? You know, and they had to inform me. Riz means somebody with charm, right? Somebody smooth, somebody 
uh, with all the moves. That's somebody with, with riz, apparently. Well, I'm here to tell you, teenagers, that uh, the one with true riz, the original riz, is in fact the Holy Spirit, right? Because the word charisma is actually his word. But, but, but this word charisma doesn't mean what you maybe think it means. The word charisma simply means gift. It means a gracious gift. You say, why is that so important? Why belabor that point? Here's why, because this means spiritual gifts are not something we earn. These are not something that we deserve. Spiritual gifts are not something we are entitled to. No, they are gracious, benevolent gifts from God. Therefore, unlike the Corinthians, we must never boast about or take pride in our gifts, but we should be humble about and thankful for any gifts that God has given to each and every one of us. Notice the structure in verses four through six. Um, I've laid it out for you on the screen here. Paul says there's a varieties of gifts and services and activities. And notice that these words are parallel as you line the sentences up, showing this that Paul is using three different words to describe basically the same thing. So spiritual gifts are also ways to serve. They are also activities that we engage in. Uh, notice also remarkably that we see that the Spirit and the Lord, that is the Lord Jesus, and then God, that is God the Father, and they are also aligned in a parallel way in order to emphasize that the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are three persons but one God, and this triune God is involved with spiritual gifts. Isn't that interesting? So the Holy Spirit gives these gifts, and we serve the Lord Jesus with our gifts, and God the Father. Father empowers the use of our gifts so that they might be effective. Notice also how these verses show the importance of both unity and diversity. In fact, we might say they show us unity in diversity, and we can see this here because Paul says there are, notice, varieties, varieties of gifts, varieties of service, varieties of activities. And yet, these various gifts come from the same spirit, the same Lord, right? The same God. You see it? Varieties and same. Look, as you know, one of our church's lead values is the value of unity in diversity. Unity in diversity. What do we mean by that? Well, we want the gospel to be actually seen in the makeup of our church, as the gospel brings together all kinds of people, men and women, young and old, people of every color and culture, all coming together into one unified body in and under Christ. Well, unity and diversity is also seen when it comes to the use of our varied spiritual gifts. Various spiritual gifts all coming together for the unified glory of God. Unity and diversity. What this means is that the church should look a lot less like a parade of soldiers who are all wearing exactly the same uniform and sort of like marching in lockstep. The church should look less like that and the church should look more like a symphony orchestra where all these different instruments contribute to the music, the unified music. Over here is the wind instruments, right? Over here's the brass. Over there's the strings. There's the percussion over there. And everybody in their various instrumentation, they're all playing together to produce one unified, God-glorifying gospel song, unity in our diversity. Notice next in verse 7, Paul gives us the, the purpose of these gifts. So verse 7, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Uh, there's a lot in this little verse here. Uh, notice, first of all, to each is given. So, so every Christian is gifted. None is excluded. 
Notice also each is given the manifestation of the Spirit. So, so the Spirit's presence and power should be seen, manifest, as we use our gifts. Notice also that it's all for the common good, Paul says, the common good. So, so the purpose of these gifts is never selfishness, self, self-aggrandizement or, or, or pride. No, the purpose of these gifts is to benefit others. It's the mutual benefit and building up of the entire body of Christ, the church. Now, as you saw, Paul, Paul goes on to list nine spiritual gifts in verses eight through 10. Uh, I want you to realize that this is not an exhaustive list. No, this is just a sample list of gifts. These are the, the kinds of gifts that the Spirit gives to God's people. In fact, I want you to take a look at something interesting. Take a look at the screen where uh, I have compiled all the so-called spiritual gift lists that you find in the New Testament. Okay, so here's every single list. That you could do a study. This, these are the lists that you would find in the New Testament. I want you to notice, take a look at this and notice several things here. Uh, notice that in addition to some lists here in 1 Corinthians, we also have lists in Romans 12, in Ephesians 4, in 1 Peter chapter 4. As you compare all the, the gifts mentioned there, notice that some of the gifts are more like abilities. Others of the gifts appear to be more like roles in the church. Other gifts are more like stations in life. Notice that marriage or singleness, they're both called gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Remember when we covered that? Some of the gifts are more overtly sensational, like speaking in tongues. Some of the other gifts seem a little bit more uh, ordinary, like uh, things like administration, for instance. Sometimes the lists are very specific. Uh, sometimes these lists are categories, uh, like in 1 Peter. He simply says, whoever speaks and whoever serves. Two broad categories of gifts. Notice that no single list includes all the gifts, and none of the gifts is on all of the lists. What does that imply? Here's what it implies, very importantly. It implies that all of these lists are sample lists. They're not comprehensive. No, they are examples of gifts that we might expect to see in the church. Now, there's almost certainly many more gifts that you would think would be in these lists. For instance, for instance, how about a spiritual gift of prayer? Doesn't it seem reasonable that some Christians would have a special gift when it comes to, to prayer? What, what about a spiritual gift of music? Like, think about it. How much does the Bible show us the importance of music and worship? It's all over the Bible. I, I think it'd be reasonable to assume that there's a spiritual gift for leading God's people in worship. We see no gift of, say, courage or spiritual gift of patience and on and on we could go. These, these kinds of gifts might be argued from Scripture, but they're not officially on any of the lists. So what's the point? I'm driving home the point that these lists are not comprehensive. In fact, some people have argued that there may be an unlimited number of spiritual gifts, properly speaking. But the ones mentioned here in the New Testament, well, these were prominent gifts that God was using in the New Testament church. So putting this all together, uh, I would suggest that we might define spiritual gifts like this, okay? Spiritual gifts are God-given abilities and roles empowered by the Holy Spirit for the building up of the church. Spiritual gifts are God-given abilities and roles empowered by the Holy Spirit for the building up of the church. And certainly many things might fit that definition. So ask yourself, what spirit-empowered abilities and roles has God given me for the building up of his church? Am I familiar with my gifts? Am I using 
my gifts for his glory. Now, with that as a definition, let's take a quick look at the nine gifts that Paul does mention here in his sample list. Let's take a look at them one by one. So first of all, in verse eight, we see to the one is given through the spirit, the utterance of wisdom, the utterance of wisdom. Now, wisdom, as you know, is the ability to apply biblical truth and biblical principles to the everyday situations and dilemmas of life. In other words, wisdom is applied knowledge. An utterance of wisdom or a message of wisdom means that those with this gift should share their wisdom with others so that others might be built up by this gift. And so let me ask you, do you know people in our church who are, they just have this unique and evident wisdom? the kind of person that you tend to go to when you need counsel about how to honor God in particular situations or decisions in your life. Those people very likely have the spiritual gift of wisdom. Next in verse eight, we see to another, the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, the utterance of knowledge. This gift apparently is very similar to the one uh, before it, but it appears to be more focused on knowledge itself in the sense of scriptural truth or theological understanding. So, so again, do you know people in our church who, who have a knack for explaining complicated truths about God and his word and doctrine? Uh, Do you know people that can just make truth plain in a uh, spirit-filled kind of a way? Um, You might be one of those people. If so, you might have the spiritual gift of knowledge. Notice next in verse 9, we read to another faith by the same spirit, to another faith, by the same spirit. What what does he mean by this gift of faith? Well, Paul can't mean saving faith since every single Christian must have saving faith by definition, but not everyone has every gift. So this must be describing some other kind of faith. It's, It's likely that it is describing extraordinary faith. Faith to move mountains, as Jesus so famously put it. Have you ever interacted with Christians who demonstrate a sort of unique and special confidence that God will come through in this or that situation? Have you ever met people like that? With that kind of faith, that kind of confidence in God? Those people demonstrate what Paul means here by the gift of faith. Then in verse 9, we read to another, gifts of healing by the one spirit. Gifts of healing. Now, this uh, gift most certainly describes miraculous physical healings, right? Uh, Perhaps laying hands on someone, praying that they would be healed. And in fact, they are healed. Um, I want you to notice something really interesting and important. The phrase is actually plural. Plural. So we might render it gifts of healings, plural. Gifts of healings. You say, why is that important? Well, people debate, what does this mean to say healings, plural, rather than singular? Very likely what what it means is that Paul considered every unique incident where someone is prayed for and healed, Paul very likely considered every unique instance of a healing to be a gift from God for that particular case. So if you've ever seen someone in the church, like pray for someone else, that they would be miraculously healed. And then later the doctor was shocked and the scans were clear, okay? Well, in that instance, that person was given a spiritual gift of healing for that particular occasion and that particular problem. Um, 
This doesn't necessarily mean that someone who received a gift of healing can then heal at will and go make a healing ministry out of it. It seems more likely that this gift is given occasionally and for very specific purposes. So I wonder, have you ever been involved in gathering around as Christians around someone who was sick, laying on hands, praying that they would be healed? And they in fact were healed. (laughs) If that's happened for you, then God very likely gave you a gift of healing for that case. Notice next, verse 10, we read to another, the working of miracles, the working of miracles. We, we could translate this more literally as the working of powers, the working of powers. So the word miracles here describes things that unmistakably draw attention to the presence and power of God. That's what we mean by, by miracles, or powers. So casting out a demon could be an example, uh, or seeing someone healed, again, could be an example of this gift, or, or watching God answer prayer in a stunning way that shows and displays his magnificent power. All of that, I think, would fall within this gift. Again, notice that the word here is plural, the working of miracles, plural, or powers, plural. Uh, so Paul, Paul likely assumes that whenever a Christian is given the ability to do something extraordinary that draws attention to God's power, that incident should be seen as a gift for that specific occasion. Next, verse 10, notice to another prophecy, to another prophecy. All right, prophecy, the one you've all been waiting for. Here we go. Um, Prophecy is a gift, of course, that Paul will describe much more extensively and elaborately when we get to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Uh, So we'll learn a lot there. Um, Remember, we saw back in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that both men and women practiced this gift in the Corinthian church. Both men and women would pray and prophesy, as we saw. Now, from the evidence, especially in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, it seems that this gift involved someone receiving a rather spontaneous revelation from the Holy Spirit, a revelation, an impression, a vision, a thought. They received this spontaneous revelation from the Holy Spirit, and then they speak that message to others, to other Christians in order to upbuild them, in order to encourage, in in order to console and comfort. Apparently, these messages or prophecies did not come with the same authority as apostolic teaching or the scriptures themselves. In fact, these messages, we are told in scripture, these prophecies are supposed to be weighed or, or judged or tested by the truth of scripture and good doctrine. And so you can go to 1 Corinthians 14, 29 or 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 through 20. And there you'll see instruction that prophecies should be tested. In other words, these prophecies were fallible. These prophecies did not come with the same binding authority as apostolic teaching or scriptural teaching had and has. And yet, these prophecies could, in fact, be very encouraging, no doubt. If the church concluded that a prophetic message was really from the Lord, it was very encouraging. Uh, We see examples in the book of Acts where people with the gift of prophecy could could encourage, uh, they could guide, they could exhort, they could warn, um, they could even predict future events that had to do with the congregational life of this or that church. Now, here at Christ Community Church, faithful Christians in our church family disagree about whether God still gives this gift of prophecy to people in the church today. Um, There's basically two major views, all right? Some of you hold what is called the cessationist view. Try to say that 10 times really, really fast. The cessationist view. View. You can hear the word cease in that term. 
The cessationist view understands this gift of prophecy to be bound up with the ministry of the apostles and the founding of the church, okay? So this view believes that once the apostles all died, uh, once the scriptures were finished, once the church was established, God no longer gave this particular gift to the church. Uh, Others of you in this church hold what we can call the continuationist view, You can hear the word continue in that term. The continuationist view understands scripture to teach that prophecy will in fact continue as a gift until Christ comes again. And uh, I think the best versions of the continuationist view understand prophecy in the New Testament as something lesser in authority than apostolic teaching or the scriptures themselves. So two views. Now, some of you might wanna take this discussion a little further. Um, I want to recommend two books for you that can help you out, okay? So on the screen, two book recommendations. Let's just cut to the chase. I want to give you two very good books here, okay? Tom Schreiner writes from a cessationist point of view, and Sam Storms writes from a continuationist point of view. Uh, Both of these men are ferociously biblical, trustworthy, respected, and they happen to be good friends who happen to disagree on this issue, (laughs) So take a picture of the screen, consider picking up one or both books and just work through them for yourself or even better, take another Christian or two with you and and work through these issues so that you can make your own determinative decisions. Now, whether you hold that prophecy continues for the church today or not, uh, everyone in our church should agree that scripture is our final and infallible authority for the Christian life. All prophecy must align with and be subservient to God's inerrant word. But if you do conclude that God is still giving this gift of prophecy today, as we've been defining it here, maybe you're asking, well, what would it look like for someone to actually practice this gift in a church context like ours, even a context where we have a mix of opinion? Well, I would suggest that it would look like One Christian humbly sharing with another Christian what he believes God has laid on his heart to share by way of encouragement or challenge or guidance. So they should say something like this, "Uh, brother, sister, I think the Lord has laid something on my heart that I'd love to share with you. Is that okay with you? And the person on the receiving end of that is willing to be like, no thanks. Or they'd be like, sure, I'd love to hear it. And then that message is shared. Like, here's what I'm, I think I'm hearing from from the Lord for you. I just want to share that with you. And then again, on the receiving end, the Christian on the receiving end, remember, they're they're allowed to weigh, sort, compare with scripture and decide, nah, I don't really think that was the Lord. Or, yeah, that was really, that was spot on. That's, in fact, that's really encouraging that God would speak through this brother or sister right through to me. I think that's a helpful posture and way of practicing this gift. I think what's not helpful is if you go around saying, I'm a prophet and thus saith the Lord, and then, you know, give people a bunch of words. That's not, I mean, the classic and hilarious example is the young man walks up to a young woman and says, I've received a prophecy. I am supposed to date you. (laughs) And she's like, the Lord hasn't told me that prophecy. So I don't know what's going on with you, right? No, that's, that's, that's not all those kind of stereotypes. That's not what we're talking about here. I think this gift is never meant to uh, manipulate. Uh, It's always meant to edify, encourage, and serve. And we're gonna see more of this when we get to chapter 14. For now, brothers and sisters, uh, let me ask you, do you sometimes experience impressions from the Holy Spirit that you then humbly share with others and they find your words to be accurate, scriptural, and edifying? If so, you might have the gift of prophecy. All right. Uh, We're going to go a little long. Can you guys give me five more minutes? We're good? All right. Verse 10. Next we read, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits. Distinguish between spirits. Likely, this is a discernment gift. It's the ability to discern situations where the enemy is at work and demonic powers might be involved. And it's also the ability to discern those places where the Holy Spirit is in fact at work in and through God's people. 
So do you sometimes have a special intuition, a spirit-given intuition that something more is going on in a troubling situation, maybe even something demonic? Or do you often have a special awareness of how the Spirit of God is at work in situations and in the lives of, of His people? If so, you might have the gift of discerning between spirits. Next, in verse 10, we see to another various kinds of tongues, various kinds of tongues. Okay, here's the other one that a lot of you have been waiting for. <laughs> the word tongues, of course, means languages, and it refers to a spirit-empowered ability to speak in languages that are unknown to the speaker. Now, here, as you, as you know, we have another controversial gift. Some Christians believe this gift stopped when the apostles died and the church was established and the scriptures were complete. Other Christians believe that this gift remains until the return of Christ. We have both views represented in our church family. And what you believe about prophecy probably is in sync with what you believe about tongues. Now, to complicate matters, Christians in both camps, in both camps, they debate about what Paul means by various kinds of tongues. Does he mean real, known human languages that they're able to speak all of a sudden? Or, or is he describing supernatural, otherworldly, even angelic languages of some sort? I mean, keep in mind that in Acts chapter 2, the apostles were filled with the Holy Spirit and they began to speak in real languages that visitors from faraway places were able to understand. So we know it was real languages there, but on the other hand, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, as we will see, uh, Paul says that when the Corinthians speak in tongues, they utter mysteries. Mysteries that no one understands, he says. So Paul seems to describe something otherworldly something supernatural. Perhaps the way forward is to recognize that the phrase speaking in tongues can include both, both speaking known languages and also speaking supernatural languages. Now here in uh, chapter 12, verse 10, Paul describes various kinds of tongues, do you see? And, and in chapter 13, verse one, he will speak of the tongues of men and of angels. One thing that we do know is that the gift of tongues was a form of prayer. It's a form of prayer. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse two, that those who speak in a tongue speak not to men, but to God. In chapter 14, verse 14, Paul explicitly talks about praying in a tongue. Paul suggests in chapter 14, verse four, that praying in tongues builds up the one who uses this gift. In other words, this gift is a special, intimate, faith-building way of communicating straightway to God. Those of you in our church who pray in tongues, I think you'd be the first to testify that praying in tongues with this gift is a very intimate, enriching, faith-encouraging, deep experience of connection with God, fellowship with God. Apparently this gift, this particular gift builds up the body of Christ indirectly. You say, how so? Well, as Christians who pray this way are strengthened by this gift, they in turn have strength to build others up. So it strengthens the body indirectly. And as we will see in chapter 14, Paul expects Christians for the most part to pray in tongues in private prayer or small group prayer and avoid doing so in the larger assemblies of the church unless someone with a special spiritual gift of interpretation is there. Uh, so let's apply this. Do you speak in tongues, uh, brothers and sisters? If so, please know that in our church, this is nothing that you have to hide. This is nothing that you have to be ashamed of. No, praise God that he has given you this special gift with which you can commune with him. 
Uh, for others of you that do believe that this gift uh, has ceased, uh, fine. Uh, but if that's you, please be gracious, charitable, and kind, right, to those uh, who understand this gift a bit differently. Uh, here's the thing. If we practice this gift wearing the sort of biblical seatbelt that we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, I think we can all get along very well, even while holding different views about this particular gift. Okay, finally, verse 10. To another, the interpretation of tongues. Simply put, this is the spirit-given ability to understand and interpret the prayers of the one that is praying in tongues. Uh, Paul suggests, by the way, in chapter 14, that most often this gift of interpretation is given to the same person who's praying in tongues. So they can both pray and apparently interpret for the congregation to hear if the context is appropriate to do so. We'll, we'll see more on this gift when we get to chapter 14. For now, let's take a moment and step away from the trees and take a look at the forest for just a second, okay? As I said, I want you to keep in mind that these nine gifts, this is a sample list. It's not comprehensive, it's a sample list. Paul is likely emphasizing the gifts that the Corinthians would have experienced in their church life. And you will notice that he puts the gifts of tongues and interpretation of tongues last in the list. Did you notice that? You say, why is that? Well, probably it's because some of the Corinthians were taking too much pride in the gift of, of tongues and wearing it as a, a, right, a badge of pride. And so Paul puts it last in the list. Notice the repetition in this list. Paul says over and over, it's the same spirit, the same spirit, the one spirit who gives each of these gifts. So every Corinthian is gifted and it's the same gift giver in each and every case, the Holy Spirit. There's no place for pride. There's no place for divisions in the body of Christ when it comes to spiritual gifts. This leads to our final point. We've seen the Spirit's focus. We've seen the Spirit's gifts. Notice finally and very quickly, the Spirit's distribution. Verse 11, all these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Notice here the Spirit, the Holy Spirit empowers the gifts and the Spirit sovereignly distributes the gifts. He's in charge. He does what he wants. What this means is that there's no place for being jealous in the church of other people's gifts. If you find yourself jealous of other people's giftedness, take the matter up with the Holy Spirit. After all, he's the one that decides how to spread around his gifts. There's also no place for belittling the gifts of others. And look, there's no place for belittling your own spiritual gifts. Everyone is needed, including you. And the spirit of the living God has willed. Notice that word. He has willed. That means desired. He has willed to give you certain gifts for the building up of his church. That's really significant. It speaks to your value, doesn't it? Well, here's the goal. Each of us must get to the place where we notice, celebrate, and encourage all the gifts of all the saints in the body of Christ. This brings glory to God. After all, he's the one who designed his orchestra to have just the right instruments in just the right place. So, are you gifted? If you're a Christian, you are gifted indeed. The question is, what are you doing with your gifts? And how are you encouraging and celebrating the gifts of other believers all around you.